Welcome to another episode of the Fine Blue Line podcast. Two cops from cops for cops, where we discuss issues, trends, products, and so much more. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Fine Blue Line podcast. We're here with Rich from Extra Duty Solutions. And Rich is going to talk to us today about how you assign your off duty employment. So I know that. Um, off-duty employment looks a lot different in different areas of the country, and Rich can probably fill us in with that a little bit. Rich uh, has a company that will assign extra-duty employment, and he'll get a lot more in-depth into that, but uh, all around the country. So he's got different experiences with different departments that may be hired to go work at a private event, say a wedding or a dance or a birthday party, uh, to working off duty for security for a dignitary coming into town, maybe working off duty for a bar or a busy restaurant that needs somebody to go with their cash drop at night. So uh, all different types of off duty employment and rich is going to get into that. So, but first I want rich to go ahead and introduce himself, um, how he came to extra duty solutions and where he came from. So rich, take it away, buddy. Rob, thanks for having me on. Uh, My name is Rich Milliman. I'm with uh, Extra Duty Solutions. We started our firm in um, 2015. We actually started it to help corporations interact with law enforcement agencies for extra duty. So if you think about it, if you're the chief security officer of a of a large retailer that has stores across the country and you want officers in 300 of your locations on Saturday night, you have to call 300 different police departments. So we started with the thinking that we'll, you just call us and we'll call the 300 police departments. And, um, and in so doing that, we realized that it's not just painful on the corporation side, it's painful on the, on the law enforcement side too. You're getting calls all the time. You're getting all these questions. You have to deal with scheduling. You have to deal with communicating the jobs, invoicing collections. It's a lot of work. So we, uh, we, we formed, um, um, infrastructure to help, uh, law enforcement agencies. Our first client on the law enforcement side was January 2016. Now we have 67 clients, uh, law enforcement agencies in 13 different states, and we exited the corporate market totally, so we didn't have any conflict of interest there. Um, but the way we got into this to begin with is I worked um, at a large um, uh, financial services firm, and, and uh, another guy that worked there was the head of physical security. I was the head of risk. And so we used to occasionally utilize extra duty officers for security reasons, for one reason or another. And we both ended up leaving and realized that, wow, you know, it's the the interaction between the customers or the vendors, as they're sometimes called, and the law enforcement agencies can be bumpy and kind of grindy. And we could get in the middle and and help things out. So that's that's a little bit about where we came from and where we are now and and how we got into this uh, before the company started. Excellent. That's Great. So you guys formed it together, sounds like? Yeah, we started it together um, in 15. Uh, like I said, our first uh, law enforcement client was the beginning of 16. And um, now we have a staff of um, about 37 people um, between our account managers, account coordinators, finance, and so on. Uh, two months ago, um, we bought a software firm called uh, Jivasoft out of Texas. We had a partnership with Jivasoft for the last several years. Um, they built our back office software that we use for scheduling. It's extremely robust, and it allows us to handle a wide variety of different scheduling algorithms. And as you said, it's, it's different, different parts of the country, different agencies have different ways of divvying up the jobs, um, and we can handle most anything that's thrown at us. And uh, we um, advanced that partnership. Uh, like I said, two months ago, we bought Jivasoft, so now we we're uh, also in, in the software business. So do you guys manage that? Do they manage it for you? Do you own the uh, software or did they just create it for you? How'd that work? In the beginning, we took, uh, Jivasoft already had on-duty scheduling software and extra-duty scheduling software. And in the very beginning, uh, we just utilized their extra-duty uh, scheduling software. Over time, because we got more and more departments signed up with us and they had, uh, we needed a wider and wider variety of ways of, scheduling um, officers, depending on each department's individual rules, we kept customizing and augmenting that extra duty software for our needs. Um, And then uh, it just made sense to kind of merge what we did with the software. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're, um, 
Cubisoft's a division uh, of ours now, but they they are one of the country's leading providers of on duty and extra duty scheduling software, and and I in my opinion make the by far the most robust software that's available. Awesome. So, what would you say your primary function is? Um, is it is it something I guess? I mean, obviously you're scheduling people, but is it would uh, say the uh, the FOP or the union or the association hire you? Would the city hire you? Who comes to you as your actual client? Yeah, so who comes to us initially can either be the chief or command staff or the union or sometimes the city folk. Uh, you know, the BA business administrator or the CFO. There's been a couple cases where a county prosecutor came to us and said. Uh, there is a law enforcement agency in our county who, you know, just got uh, had a number of federal indictments due to um, um, egregious behavior in our extra duty program. Can you come in and and, and administer their program? So there's a hands off um, kind of an arrangement where, um, you, where there's less likely to be these types of problems going forward. But any of those groups can come to us. Um, our contract typically is with the municipality. So. We're working for a particular agency. That the municipality, that agency is within. That's typically who we have our contract with. Um, but you know, the scheduling um, is really kind of one fourth of what we do. Um, there's, if you think about an extra duty program, there's really four parts to it. There's the interaction with the customers or vendors. So you have, you know, Walmart or movie theaters or whomever. Uh, construction firms calling and saying, hey, what are your rates? I need two officers tomorrow. It's raining today. I'm not going to do this job today. Can you move my team to Friday? Uh, I need two officers instead of one this Saturday night because we have a premiere and we're expecting more people to show up at the movie theater. So there's all that interaction. So that's part one. Part two is the actual communicating of the details and scheduling the officers into the details. And I'm convinced that no two law enforcement agencies in America have the exact same way of scheduling officers. There's a myriad of ways to do that. Part three of what we do is paying the officers. Um, and part four, what we do is the invoicing and collections with the customers or the, or the vendors, as they're sometimes called. So we really provide a managed service where we are administering the program on behalf of the uh, the agency. So we work for the agency in partnership. Again, we do not work directly for the customers or the vendors. We don't sign contracts with them. So oh, we're never conflicted. Our, our interests are always perfectly aligned with the agency and municipality. So say I own a movie theater in my hometown and I need an officer and I call the police department and say, Hey, I need an officer for Friday night. Are they going to tell me, okay, here's who you need to call. And they give, put me in contact with you guys. T typically when we start, we get a list of all the customers that that agency has worked with in the last year. We usually get that from the CFO and we reach out. If it's a big department, if you know, giant hospital complexes or something like that, we'll physically go and talk to them. Um, but typically, more typically, we send out letters and, hey, here's the phone number, here's the email address that you use. Um, so the, the existing customers all hear about us that way. And then new customers, you know, typically what happens is um, uh, you'll go on the website of the law enforcement agency and it'll say, call this number if you're interested in hiring an officer. And that number will be our number. So every one of our agencies has a local number. And even though it ring, it's local to that area, it rings where we are, where our account managers are. So, um, or if you go on a website of one of our agencies, a lot of times it'll say, um, you know, go email this email, and the email will be one of our emails. So that's, that's how you end up coming to us. Do you have operators on 24 hours a day? Oh yeah. So we have four operation centers. Um, Shelton, Connecticut, Wall, New Jersey, Tampa, Florida, San Antonio, Texas. We're 24 seven. Um, so we have, you know, we have account teams that work by, by time zone. So if you're a, uh, you know, our Arizona departments, their account teams work Arizona time or New Jersey departments, their account teams work uh, New Jersey time. But then we also have second shift, third shift, weekend shift. So we're 24 seven, you know, in a lot of departments, especially in the Northeast and the mid Atlantic and new England, 
somebody hits a telephone pole at three in the morning and Verizon has live wires on the street and needs two officers to help out on traffic control, that's extra duty. Verizon pays for that. Um, so in a typical night at our current level of, of, of number of um, departments we have, typically between midnight and 8 a.m. on the East Coast, we'll get 60 or 70 calls for emergency jobs or moving jobs around, uh, things like that. So yeah, we're we we never go to sleep. And the other thing that we do too is the account teams that serve our our departments are are split across at least two of our call centers of our operation centers. And the reason we do that is if there's a hurricane that hits Tampa and people can't get into the operation center, those calls within three seconds will be transferred to San Antonio or or, or, or uh, Connecticut. So I you know I like to say if we're completely down. Law enforcement has something much bigger to worry about than extra duty. For sure, because it, chances are, if it's that big of a disaster, your admin's going to be out in the field. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be all hands on deck, and nobody's worried about showing up at the movie theater on Saturday night. So yeah, we're 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 um, you know ninety four percent of our calls are answered by the end of ring two. It doesn't matter if it's three a.m. or three p.m. So when you know we staff actually we'll we'll beef up staffing. If it's raining on the East Coast, if it's supposed to rain tomorrow. On the East Coast, we'll beef up staffing because we know that we're going to get a lot of calls in the morning from contractors and utility firms that are going to be moving jobs around or canceling jobs. So we need to be prepared for that. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're 24-7, 365. So when we talked before the other day, you said that you would describe it kind of as the administ- you would administrate the extra duty for the municipality. So when you got the call from, say, the union – um, would you eventually work your way to sign the contract with the city or would you sign the contract with the union or does it depend, I guess, how they have it set up? It, no, it's almost, uh, I think every single time it's with the city. Um, you know, we, when we come in to meet with the department and talk about what we do and if our service is something they would be interested in a lot, you know, the best meetings are where the chief, the CFO, the VA, the union president, and, you know, whoever else wants to be in that meeting is in there and we hit them all at one time. Sometimes if we call, if we come in and we first meet with the the union or we first meet with the chief, there'll be a second meeting to meet with that broader group. You know, the BA wants to know what's going on, the CFO, especially in larger municipalities. Um, but if they decide to move forward, I think in every single case so far, the actual agreement and our agreements month to month, it's, 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 you know, relatively breezy. If somebody doesn't like us, they should just fire us. Um, but it, our, the agreement is actually signed with the municipality. Well, and you talked about the four parts or the four services uh, that you guys provide. So client interaction, your chief's going to want to be involved with that because you're representing his police department. Scheduling's where the union is going to want to be involved. And then you said the CFO, the chief financial officer several times, invoicing and collection of payments. So I can see where you say it's the best option to get everybody in the same room because different parts affect different groups. You know what I mean? You're exactly right. So, you know, know, when when, when when any one of us here goes through our service with the group, you can, you know, the questions in the beginning, like you said, the first section, the chief is asking questions. The second chef, second on scheduling, the union starts asking questions. And then the CFO kind of asks more of the questions on the on units three and four where we're talking about how we're paying and how we're invoicing and so on. Okay, so I'm in a unique situation. I'm a low-level patrol line officer, okay? So that's my job. Now, I live 30 minutes from where I work, and I'm a city councilor. So I'm going to ask you some questions from both perspectives and, and uh, try and get some answers from you. So I'm a patrol officer right now. I've been a union president. So liability, two big questions there. First one is in Washington state, we have labor and industries. Some places call it OSHA, but if you get hurt on the job, you're covered for your medical, you know, uh, you dislocate your shoulder in a fight, break your leg or whatever. So are we covered be, are, now we're employees of the city while we're doing our extra duty, or are we employees of extra duty solutions? No, you're not employees of extra duty solutions. So you're still an employee of the city. Uh, depending on how we pay the officers, we can pay in one of two ways. We can either pay directly. In other words, we're sending checks and direct deposits to the actual officers, in which case they're 1099 contractors to us. Um, or we pay the municipality, who in turn pays the officers. And in, in, in that case, when you get your paycheck, typically there's two line items. One is active duty and one's extra duty. 
So we can pay either either way. But to to go to answer the question, um, you know, let's split insurance into two parts. So typically, the way you think about insurance is there's liability insurance, and that can be kind of financial liability and bodily harm, more typically known as uh, professional um, and general liability. And then there's workers' comp. So the example you were going on the path of would have been a workers' comp claim. So um, on the liability side, we we have you know millions and millions of dollars of liability insurance, which is added to whatever the municipality has. And typically, the way I think about it is our liability insurance is not in front or behind of the municipalities of the liability insurance, it's just added to it. So if something does happen, say there's an officer working at a um, at a festival and he's on horseback working an extra duty uh, uh, detail, uh, the horse uh, has a heart attack and dies and on a way down breaks some girl's legs. Those girl's legs are covered by liability insurance. Now, whose liability insurance actually pays out the claim, ours or the municipalities? That just depends on when the lawyers get in the room and how they divvy things up. But we're there on, in addition to the municipality, okay? On the workers' comp, uh, that can work in a variety of ways, and it depends, you know, it differs state by state, and in some places it, differ, it differs municipal ordinance by municipal ordinance. But um, when we're paying the city, who in turn is paying the officers, the officers are being w 2 by their by their municipality. They're covered under the workers' comp of the municipality. There's no difference between on and extra duty in that situation from a workers' comp standpoint. When we're paying the, the officers directly, it can work out in a few different ways. So there's three basic ways that they can be covered under workers' comp. One is, in many cases, this, the municipality still covers them. And in certain states, that's the way it is. If you're If you're a peace officer, or, you know, sworn officer um, in certain states, it doesn't matter what you're doing and if you're in uniform or not. If you are acting on behalf of the municipality and a law enforcement engagement, you're covered under the workers' comp. Uh, now, there's, you know, a lot of ins and outs and nuances in what I just said there, but that's the umbrella. Um, in, in certain cases, we will cover the officers under our workers' comp if that's what the municipality wants. So we can do that in any state, uh, and we do that in several states. Um, and then a third option is some municipalities have the customers or the vendors cover the officers under their workers' comp and and prove that they have workers' comp to do so. So that can, that can that can work in a variety of ways. Patron is a form of crowdsourcing in the podcast world where your crowd helps donate to the show to keep it going. So what I'm going to ask you to do is if you want to become a patron, go to Patreon, which there is a link in the upper right hand corner of our website, which is findbluelinepodcast.com. And you can cap the amount that you donate each month so that you don't go over. Right now we're set up at three tiers. The tiers are Patrol Officer, which is $1 per podcast, Sergeant, which is $3 per podcast, or Chief, which is $5 per podcast. And each one of those levels come with different benefits as far as things you'll get when you sign up. These different costs that uh, are associated with podcasting are offset by people like yourselves that help me with the show. So some of the fees that we have are equipment, domain names, web hosting, audio hosting, email services, computer software, and all of that type of stuff. So, Patron is a way that you can donate per episode, and I don't charge you unless I put out an episode. You can cap it, so say you don't want to get charged, uh, say you sign up for Sergeant at $3 a month, you don't want to get charged any more than 12 you can cap it at 12 and that way, if for some reason I put out 10 episodes one month, you won't get dinged for $30. So that last example, that would be the movie theater or wherever? Yeah, so they say a movie theater where they call and say, hey, we want to hire two officers for Saturday night. If we've never worked with that movie theater before in that municipality, in that geographic footprint, we're going to send them an online form. They have to fill it out just one time. After that, they can just call us or email us for details. But that online form 
among other things, has on it uh, agreement to terms and conditions. So in that particular example, the municipality would require in their terms and conditions acknowledgement that they have workers' comp insurance and that the officers are covered under that workers' comp insurance. They would also have to um, attach a COI, a certificate of insurance, evidence evidencing the workers' comp insurance. So we're we have you know part of our infrastructure is document management systems that integrate directly a, a lot of times with the municipality to make sure that these things are in place before any officer is scheduled to make sure the officers are protected. Okay, so I'm big in the Fraternal Order Police, and if you listen to this podcast, you know that. So I want to make a little plug here. Uh, Long and short-term disability insurance, whether you're covered through uh, labor and industries or not, a lot of us know if we've been hurt that that uh, does not necessarily cover us 100% pay. So go out and get yourself some insurance. That's my suggestion. Next question for you, Rich. Uh, Shooting. So I end up uh, getting into a shooting. Who covers me there? Same type of situation or? Yeah, it's and it, it's it's very hard to come up with an example where an officer working an extra duty detail and there's some type of police activity like a shooting or even not even you don't have to go that far. You just um, you're running after somebody where you'd actually be considered the, the, the officer would still be considered to be on extra duty at the time of the incident. So, you know, typically the first step you take towards a um, what you call police activity you're basically considered on duty at that point. So let's say you're working an extra duty detail in the bank branch and you're standing uh, providing a presence and security and you hear somebody yell help because they're being physically attacked at another part of the bank branch. The second you start running towards that person, you're now considered on duty. So, you know, you're, in a sense, the extra duty detail has ended and you're now covered on, on all the regular insurances you are as on duty. So, it's actually kind of difficult to come up with an example of somebody um, injured in a workers' comp claim or, you know, involved in a shooting, especially um, uh, in an extra duty detail. Because if you think about it, the only reason you're going to be involved in a shooting situation is because somebody's breaking the law in a pretty violent way. Um, there's a major public safety issue. And you're now considered, as, a, as you're acting in that role of a police officer, you're considered to be active duty at that point. Let me take it a step further. Um, I'm at the bank today, off duty completely, and I end up taking some type of police action. It's the position of the police department that I work for that you will turn in an overtime slip to put yourself on duty because you're, you're initiating a police action. Exactly. And I believe the Justice Department, after um, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, when they did a major investigation into the New Orleans Police Department, I believe that was the catalyst for the Justice Department coming up with some definitions around this. And they one of the, the fallouts of that was something that, uh, from a layman's standpoint, is called the first step rule, which um, from a Justice Department standpoint basically says, the first step you take towards um, an event or a situation which you were doing so as a result of you are a uniformed officer or not even you are a sworn officer, as you mentioned, you may be playing clothes, um, you are now considered on duty. So in your particular case, from a finance standpoint, as you just mentioned, you may have to turn in an overtime slip because that's how the, you know, the bureaucracy works. There, there's, a, um, there's payment issues and so on. But putting that aside, that first step you take towards that situation because, and you're doing so because you're a sworn officer, you're now on duty. Okay, so step further again. If you uh, take a police action and you are criminally charged, it's uh, becoming more and more common that the city will no longer protect you civilly. So another reason to get the legal defense plan from the Fraternal Order Police, because it will cover you criminally, civilly, and administratively, depending on what package you buy. So that's another thing that you can check into if you're an FOP member. So next question, cost to the city in this uh, whole extra duty deal. Yeah, so the cost to the city is zero for our service, and the cost to the police department and the officers is zero around around the field there. We charge a uh, administrative fee to the vendor, the customer or the vendor. Um, so basically, if um, uh, let's use, or we'll pick on Verizon, if they were going to get an invoice for eight hundred dollars 
they may they may now get an invoice for 860 880 or something like that depending on what our fee is our fee is determined by what the officer makes um so in certain parts of the country where um uh officers are making you know over a hundred dollars an hour or close to it our fee is pretty low as a percentage our, our fee is always a percentage on top and in other parts of the country where the the rates are extremely low or or fees can be, you know, 12 and a half, 13 percent. But on average, if you look across the whole country, we're probably about 10 percent on average. OK, uh, who does the invoicing? I mean, obviously you guys do because you mentioned it, but uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. So the way um, let's talk about how it normally works when we're not involved. Typically, um, you know, a lot of times I'll hear police chiefs um kind of say, well, you know, this extra duty program is really taking a lot of time. I have a lieutenant that does nothing but manage the program. I have a patrolman that works for the lieutenant who's taken all the calls, and then we get calls all at night. You're usually only seeing half the picture at that point because typically in the, in the municipality, in the finance department, there's a whole other group of people that are sending out invoices and making collection calls and so on. So um, we take on that administrative burden. So it, 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 and it typically ties to the customer, the um, officer pay. So we we pay officers whenever the department kind of wants us to. We typically just mimic their active duty pay. So if their active duty pay is weekly or biweekly or twice a month, um, that's typically what we how we pay the cadence that we pay the extra duty on too. And uh, we we also at the same time that we pay or sometimes just weekly. We send invoices out to the uh, customers, and, and it's our problem. So if uh, if a big utility doesn't pay for three months or four months after we send that invoice, that's our problem. The, we've already paid the the officer. Likewise, if we extend credit to a, you know, a little landscaper who goes out of business the week after a detail, that's our problem, too. We're, we're taking that risk. So there's we alleviate the financial risk of which there are two parts. There's the float risk, how much money will it cost me to give these interest-free loans on float to the customers. And there's the credit risk. What happens if they don't? I never get paid? We take that risk away from the municipality. So there's no more financial risk to the municipality once we show up. So you're floating the money on these projects. Do you, um, I mean, you could answer this or not, I guess. Do you have a big problem with collecting at times or, or? No, um, you know we're not we're not complete idiots about it either. So if you know we get a call from some little like I'll, I'll pick on a landscaper again, and we've never heard of them before, what we'll typically do is we'll call our liaison in the police department. We typically have one contact in the police department that we can go to with any types of questions or anything like that, and we'll say, "Have you guys ever worked with these guys before? We've never heard of them." And if they say no, you know we can't really vouch for them. We'll either have that little landscaper prepay escrow. Or, or we'll we'll be we're willing to invoice him, but we'll get a credit card on file. So if he doesn't pay the invoice, we'll charge the credit card after days fifty. Um, but in the last twelve months, we've invoiced probably about thirty five million dollars, and I bet you our bad debts is twenty five thousand or something like that. Because you know this is what we do. It's not like we're protecting and serving during the day and doing this on the side. Um, you know we have all sorts of checks and balances and guard rails around us and infrastructure build up to make sure that we're doing this, you know, the right way. So we, you know, we, we take the right precautions to make sure to get out ahead of and uh, that we don't have a bad debts problem. And as a result, we don't. Well, you probably wouldn't be in business very long if you didn't take those precautions. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Rich, um, I, that's about the questions I had for you. So what else do you want to add? Do you, um, I know that there's, like you said, there's so many different ways that uh, extra duty is assigned. I know that in our department, we have an extra duty call out list that goes in order. I know of a department that uh, hangs it up on the board and first come first serve. So if it's your day off, you're uh, not getting an opportunity to sign up. I know of a department that uh, uh, union or guild makes the phone calls to fill up the uh, extra duty uh, assignments. And then, you know, obviously there's just people that are using you folks. So, I mean, there's just so many different ways out there, but this, uh, I mean, this takes the municipality out of it and puts the onus on you guys, the billing, the invoicing. I mean, 
you know, like I said, assigning it's just one component you explained, and that is huge to uh, take the burden off of a police department or take the burden off of um, the city administration or whatever. So um, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, well, let's talk about scheduling for a minute. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, I, in my opinion, no two departments are scheduling the exact same way. There's a multitude of ways to do it. Um, and it, we typically do whatever the municipality does, whatever the agency does before we show up. So I don't think there's ever been a case where we came in and said, all right, from now on, you're going to have to do scheduling this way, or you can no longer, you know, utilize this rule that you used to have or something like that. We typically do what they want us to do. And that's how robust our, or and flexible our infrastructure is. But if I, if I step back from scheduling in America on, on extra duty solutions and squint, um, uh, the closer you get to New York and Boston, the more complex the scheduling algorithms become. So I've seen departments in the Northeast and New England that have 12 different rotation lists, or we have one client <clears throat> in New Jersey that has four different ways of assigning jobs depending on the type of job and when it is and when it came in and the pay rate. We have one department up in uh, Massachusetts that has more pay rates than they have officers. <clears throat> um, so it gets... It can get complex up there. As you as you move into the south, um, not so much Florida, but you know most of the southern uh, states, it becomes a lot less complex. A lot of those states, <clears throat> I see agencies with first come first serve, or as you said, sign up sheets out on a board, um, and you know we try to mimic whatever they do. I actually did a a webinar uh, a couple months ago on what we've seen in scheduling algorithms. Like what are the different types of algorithms out there? What are the more common types used? And what um, we've seen as fair and unfair, you know? Cause it, you have a scheduling algorithm that is perceived as unfair and it can end up with no end of problems for the, the chief and, and, the, and the union president with complaints and union grievances. And we've heard of fist fights in the hallways or all sorts of things. So. Um, so yeah, anybody who's listening that wants to wants to get a good opinion on uh, and a you know kind of a, a view of the landscape of scheduling algorithms, I'd encourage you to go on our website to the media uh, page and and look at our uh, the webinar. It's only about a half an hour, but it's a good it's a good viewpoint of what what tends to work well and what tends to lead to problems in that that arena. Well, don't screw with people's time and money. So if somebody thinks they're getting gypped out of their three hour overtime gig, I can, I can see the fist fight happening. I would just laugh personally. Yeah, but. Exactly. And, and it's the same, it's not just the scheduling, it's the rules and the processes. So we, you know, again, we, the, the department, when we come in, if the department wants to move forward to it with us, we have either a call or an in-person meeting where we go through all the rules and how things work. So do you have minimums or officers are allowed to cancel once they sign up for a job? Um, what, you know, what are the cancellation policies for the customer? What are the minimum payments? What are the rates if it's Saturday, St. Patrick's Day, it's a liquor job and it's a four-man job at a lieutenant. Um, so we go through all that and, again, customize our infrastructure and our processes for that particular department so that there's, you know, really no change from the, the, the rules and the processes before we were involved to after we were involved. Now, where there's changes, now you have sophisticated technology, you have an app, you have a way of, inter, in, you know, even the customers, the vendors, we have um, uh, logons for those guys so they can see what jobs they've had, what they paid, what they haven't paid yet, what jobs have uh, in the future are filled and unfilled. So there's a lot of um, very useful technology that we throw on top of those rules and processes. But the core of how things get done, we try not to change that at all. So if you're the poor guy sitting in front of the phone, making the phone calls, trying to fill a holiday overtime gig on a holiday weekend, uh, check in to Extra Duty Solutions. We'll have a link to their website in the show notes to this episode and a lot of good information on there. Um, they've got links for client interaction, scheduling, client invoicing, officer payment. And a big thing to note is zero fees to your department. That will be recuperated through the end client to Extra Duty Solutions. And as you heard there with their scheduling, they can, uh, and, and payment, they can take a lot of different things that are in place already and adapt to make it work. 
So Rich, hey buddy, I want to thank you for coming on today and, and teaching us about this. I think it's something that a lot of departments can use and it would honestly free up an officer or two, depending on the size of the department. Yeah, no, uh, um, first of all, thank you for having me on, Rob. I really enjoyed it. But yeah, you know, in a typical department that we see, like you said, you might have a half of an officer or a full-time officer. I just met with a department last week that has a staff of 10 full-time officers and civilians that do nothing but administer their program. We had one, one department where, before we started, the BA wanted um, like an accounting firm or somebody to come in and find out, well, how much does it cost them to run their program? And when they added the whole thing up with salaries and, you know, the, the, the money on top of the salaries, um, the, the float, the bad debts, the technology they use and so on, it came out to something like $330,000. And we're probably administering that program for like a 75 K. So, um, we can do it in a typically in a much more efficient way, but one that doesn't degrade the, the rules or the, you know, require changing or cust customizing towards what we do. We customize what we do for what, you know, your needs are. And that 75 K is not on their backs anymore either. So technically they're going back that, that, that apartment saved like 300 K um, right off the bat and freed up to uh, two people on the, on the police force side. And I think one or two people over on the finance side who was running after bad debt. So um, yeah, it's, it was a big savings for them. Yeah, get those guys back on the road where they can, uh, you know, back each other up and help each other out. So great. Yeah, uh, we'll do the, you know, the administrative stuff. You guys can protect and serve. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Well, hey, Rich, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it, Rob. Thanks a lot. The officer we're going to feature today from the Officer Down Memorial page is Detective Christopher Cranston from the New York City Police Department. His end of watch was Saturday, July 20th, 2019. Detective Christopher Cranston died as a result of cancer that he developed following his assignment to the search and recovery efforts at the World Trade Center site following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Detective Cranston is survived by his wife. On the morning of September 11, 2001, 72 officers from a total of eight local, state, and federal agencies were killed when terrorist hijackers working for the Al-Qaeda terrorist network headed by Osama bin Laden crashed four hijacked planes into the World Trade Center towers in New York City, the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, and a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. After the impact of the first plane into the World Trade Center's North Tower, putting the safety of others before their own, law enforcement officers, along with fire and EMS personnel, rushed to the burning twin towers of the World Trade Center to aid the victims and lead them to safety. Due to their quick actions, it is estimated that over 25,000 people were saved. As the evacuation continued, the South Tower unexpectedly collapsed as a result of the intense fire caused by the impact. The North Tower collapsed a short time later. 71 law enforcement officers, 343 members of the New York City Fire Department, and over 2,800 civilians were killed at the World Trade Center site. A third hijacked plane crashed into a field in rural Pennsylvania when the passengers attempted to retake control of the plane. One law enforcement officer who was a passenger in the plane was killed in that crash. The fourth hijacked plane was crashed into the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia, killing almost 200 military and civilian personnel. No law enforcement officers were killed at the Pentagon on 9-11. The terrorist attacks resulted in the declaration of war against the Taliban regime, the illegal rulers of Afghanistan, and the Al-Qaeda terrorist network, which also was based in Afghanistan. On September 9, 2005, all of the public safety officers killed on September 11, 2001, were posthumously awarded the 9-11 Heroes Medal of Valor by President George W. Bush. The contamination in the air at the World Trade Center site caused many rescue personnel to become extremely ill and eventually led to the death of several rescue workers. On May 1, 2011, members of the United States military conducted a raid on a compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, and killed Osama bin Laden. Please keep Detective Christopher Cranston, the New York City Police Department, and his family in your thoughts and prayers, as well as the other officers that responded that day, and firefighters as well. His age was 48. Cause was a 9-11 related illness. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fine Blue Line Podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can contact the podcast through our Facebook page, Fine Blue Line Podcast, our web address, finebluelinepodcast.com, our email, rob at finebluelinepodcast.com, or you can call us at 208-918-3025. And as always, stay safe.